40 summers ago, Friday the 13th scared us out of the woods and out of our minds. But where did such a voyeuristic tale of blood-splattered murder and creative mayhem originate? Through 13 watchlist picks, we resurrect the bloody roots of the prototypical summer camp slasher, Friday the 13th. Jason, I've been watched every minute. Let's get right to the point with John Carpenter's Halloween. The 1978 slasher that first dominated the box office and cemented the horror subgenre as a cinematic staple. Point of view shots, young stars in sexy and or scary predicaments, and a sizable body count were all made mainstays by Halloween. Death has come to your little town, Sheriff. You can either ignore it or you can help me to stop it. Director Sean S. Cunningham was so set on making Friday the 13th the next big bloody hit that he took out an ad in Variety for his proposed horror opus before he even had a script. Quit now! Quit? Why would I want to quit? Cunningham's gamble paid off, and Mama Voorhees birthed a horror franchise in those murky waters of Camp Crystal Lake. But to understand what films this template was built upon, we'll need to talk about censorship. As Hollywood relaxed moral guidelines in the late 1960s, filmmakers pushed the boundaries for what was acceptable, and a horror maestro named George A. Romero doubled down on the gore for what he'd call a splatter film. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Night of the Living Dead was a sea change in what could be projected in the US, but Romero wasn't the first to push the gory envelope or to work in the splatter subgenre. That on goes to writer, director, and schlockmeister general, Herschel Gordon Lewis. This type of affair is my specialty. Creating exploitation films for drive-ins, Lewis had to keep up with changing tastes, so he tried his hand at a pair of bare-bones horror films that prioritize shocking bloodshed over, well, everything else. Regardless, 1963's Blood Feast and 1964's 2000 Maniacs were essentials to the summer camp slasher's bloody roots. Wait a minute, there's enough fun for everybody. This ghoulish genesis of the Voorhees can also be traced across the pond, first to Italy and to director Mario Bava's 1963 black and white whodunit, The Girl Who Knew Too Much which was recut and released in the U.S. as The Evil Eye, but we'll stick with the original title. With this title, Bava referenced a horror hero of his, Alfred Hitchcock, who we'll get back to in a moment, and Hitchcock's two films titled The Man Who Knew Too Much. But Bava was also striking out into a brand new subgenre that he was creating, and that would be greatly influential on American horror, one called Giallo, so named for the yellow covers of Italian crime pulp fiction. Tutti gli uomini sono stati trattenuti e sono sicura ormai che l'assassino è uno di loro. With 1964's Blood and Black Lace, Bava would further establish the underpinnings of Giallo, and his 1971 film A Bay of Blood would greatly influence the original Friday the 13th, with its similar death scenes and summer camp setting. And if we're discussing Giallo, we must mention Dario Argento's The Bird with the Crystal Plumage from 1970, which popularized the high style of Italian horror on the worldwide stage and acknowledged the voyeuristic nature of this cinematic style that was still alive and well a decade later in Friday the 13th. Ah, hey, peeping Tom, eh? <laughs> so sorry. But these films and filmmakers owe a debt of gratitude to a pair of very different English auteurs and two 1960 films released within months of each other that got diametrically opposed responses. Whatever made you think of that? Director Michael Powell's Peeping Tom, a voyeuristic tale of a photographer with a deadly tripod, was derided by UK critics as beastly trash that deserved to be flushed down the sewer, but found a cult following and critical reassessment years later. Meanwhile, Hitchcock guarded the ghastly secrets of his landmark thriller Psycho by refusing early screenings to critics and doing all the promotion himself. In this house, 
the most dire, horrible events took place. Audiences were shocked by Psycho's twists and shower scene, and despite some mixed reviews from offended critics, the movie was a surprise hit that sparked a horror revival throughout the 60s. The formerly stringent censorship was eroding, and moviegoers were demanding more bloodshed. We all go a little mad sometimes. Haven't you? Many tried throughout the 70s, but nobody delivered the thrills, chills, and kills like Friday the 13th. Although we have to note that the series' infamous impaler, the great hockey-masked hero killer Jason Voorhees, was only briefly seen in the first film, didn't get the goalie gear until the third, and it was the ensuing 11 follow-ups that would delve into his life and sprees. Jason, mother is talking to you! We'd suggest you add 1982's Friday the 13th Part 3 to your watch list for its perfect blend of summertime pranks, murderous mayhem, and eye-popping 3D gimmicks. And if you want Voorhees at perhaps his most unhinged, the 10th Friday the 13th film, 2001's Jason X, or Spacen as it's known by fans, shot the franchise into outer space. It's been modified. LeBron James had designs on rebooting the series back in 2018, so there's still hope for the Voorhees legacy. Perhaps they'll even be able to finally make a 13th Friday the 13th film. No matter what, the new film must stay rooted in its blood-splattered Italian giallo and psycho past to once more connect with Jason's hordes of fans. We'll never come back again. Oh, shut up, Ralph. 